Hi there, this is Dr. Robert Sivas, the Carb Addiction Doc. Welcome back to my series of podcasts. Today, we're going to address a critical concept in the world out there that is just totally misunderstood and screwed up. We're going to talk about cholesterol and statins. This is a very, very important current topic in healthcare. So the way it works is this. It's very, very simple to understand statins and cholesterol biologically. The first problem is that the word cholesterol is a misnomer. Cholesterol is vital in the human body. And it's not actually cholesterol that's at issue. It's the molecule that transports cholesterol amongst other things, including fat, in your body called LDL or low-density lipoprotein. It's this conglomerate molecule that, that transports fat and cholesterol between your liver primarily and your fat cells and back. And it delivers cholesterol and fat to the tissues where it gets used in cell membranes and as an energy substrate to produce energy from fat. That's LDL's job. And LDL, even though there are several of them, LDL is the most stable, longest lasting of these lipoproteins in the bloodstream. The question, though, is this. There is an assumption, and it's a very commonly held assumption, and the reason it's an, the reason it's an assumption, not a fact, is because there is zero evidence to support what everybody out there believes. The concept is this, that LDL damages blood vessels. That LDL damages blood vessels and builds up and eventually blocks blood vessels or breaks off, travels downstream and obstructs blood vessels resulting in heart attacks and strokes. That is the conventional ideology out there. It's an assumption, it's a belief. There are zero facts, zero facts, zero evidence to support that LDL causes damage directly. But if you believe it does, then clearly reducing your LDL formation and reducing cholesterol in your LDL uh, production should then result in a lower risk of heart attacks or strokes. And again, the evidence is just not there. The evidence is just not there. And I'm not going to go down the evidence pathway right now. I'm going to leave that up to guys like David Diamond and Ira Cummings, the fat emperor. I urge you to go to their YouTube channels and review their talks on statins and fat. But here's where I am going to go. I'm going to talk about cause. As I said, we have zero evidence that LDL injures blood vessels or causes damage. If you believe that, Hell yes, put, a, put every patient on a statin. Put every patient on a statin, because the less damage, if it's caused by LDL, the better, the healthier you're going to be. Again, evidence just ain't there. So all these people on statins do not have a lower risk of heart attacks or strokes. Their numbers may be lower, but it's not correlating to an improvement in health. And here's why. <laughs> Very simple. LDL does not cause damage to blood vessels. So what are these people talking about? Clearly, they're not all nuts or crazy. It's not witchcraft. But here's what they don't understand. That LDL is not causing the injury. LDL is responding to the injury. Okay? So follow me along. When LDL travels between the liver and the fat cells and back, it's delivering, it's like a barge, it's delivering cholesterol and fatty acids to the fat cells and to the liver. It's just a transport molecule like cars on a road. When there's an injury to the blood vessel wall, not caused by LDL, when an injury happens to the blood vessel wall, what happens to that in, at that injury site is the very first thing that happens is the clotting cascade. You know what blood clots are, or when you cut yourself, a scab forms. Well, exactly the same thing happens inside your blood vessels. So you get an injury, you get damage, well, you don't want to leak, so the human body has this wonderful system called the clotting cascade that forms a little fibrin plug. And then the fibrin plug act, uh, uh, attracts platelets. The platelets become activated, and what activated platelets do is they, they form a denser clot, uh, uh, clot, 
And then what the activated platelets, platelets do is they attract lymphocytes and leukocytes, white blood cells, to further stabilize the clot. And it's that conglomeration, it's those white cells, that then attract LDL through a particular protein called apoprotein B that is very rich in LDL. And if that clot doesn't immediately dissolve and go away, in other words, if the injury stays. Now, what happens in the human body is we're getting injured. We're injuring our blood vessels all the time. Boom, I just injured a bunch of blood vessels. I'll form a little mini clot on that. My endothelial cells will heal up and the clot gets dissolved. So we form clots and we dissolve them all the time just by bumping and, and grinding. However, if the injury is repetitive, if that injury is happening to that blood vessel all the time, the clot forms, but it doesn't dissolve completely because the injury is still there. Now those white cells attract LDL to stabilize the clot. So if I punched a hole in the wall, that's the injury. And you come along with some spackle and you spread the spackle over the uh, hole in the wall to seal it up. That's LDL. So LDL is not causing the injury. LDL is trying to heal the injury. It's trying to put the fire out. Okay. But if you keep having that injury, you keep having more and more LDL layering down. So now you get layer upon layer upon layer. And those layers are inflamed. All those white cells are in there. All those activated platelets are in there. They're all inflamed. Oh, and by the way, interesting little fact. Part of the clotting cascade, in fact, factor four of the clotting cascade is a molecule or, or an ion called calcium. So what happens is calcium is repetitively, as these clots form and form and form, calcium is being deposited in that clot. And that we can measure it in x-rays. That's called the CAC score, the coronary artery calcium score. And you can measure the amount of calcium that's being put down in these clots. And that also correlates with the amount of LDL. But the LDL is not the problem. It's trying to fix the problem. But what happens if you've got this ongoing problem, the clot builds up and builds up, and it's soft. It's like snot. It's like jello. And sometimes it blocks the blood vessel, but that's not usually a major problem because that's a slow process. What happens, though, is sometimes these inflamed clots rupture. They pop. And when they pop, they suddenly can occlude the blood vessel. Now you're getting no blood, street, blood flow going downstream, no oxygen or nutrients, or the clot can break off. We call that an embolus. And it travels downstream, and as the blood vessels branch and narrow, eventually it clots off. It plugs up one of the branches. And if it's in your heart or in your brain, that's a heart attack or a stroke, and it happens suddenly. But that's where this big inflammatory mush of snot and jello travels downstream. Down and I was a surgeon when I was training. We did a lot of vascular surgery in Toronto. And I held and I felt the snot. And I can tell you, when you feel a plaque, it is snot. It's the snotty, gelatinous muck. It's the best explanation I can have. Gelatin or jello, same kind of equivalent thing. So, okay, we understand the truth about LDL, that LDL is not causing the problem. LDL is responding to the problem, and it's responding to a repetitive problem. So the question is, what's causing the problem? Remember I said we have zero evidence that LDL causes the problem, but we have strong evidence that at least two molecules are causing this problem and repeating the problem over and over and over again. This right here is my PhD from the University of Toronto, 1995. I am extremely, extremely proud of this document because this led me to understand obesity. And it has led me to understand metabolic syndrome. Okay, so let me take you down my research pathway. What we did in Toronto, we were concerned about livers that we were transplanting not having enough energy. And the assumption that we made is these livers didn't have enough sugar in them. So my job in the lab was to see if we can rapidly increase the amount of sugar in the liver so that, that liver, when it goes from a donor, gets removed, so it goes into a bucket and into the new transplant recipient, that the liver had enough energy from sugar to survive. That was the thought. Early 90s, 90 to 95. So I created a model where we could very rapidly increase the sugar content of the liver. And the thought was, the more sugar, the healthier the liver would be. 
But lo and behold, we kind of had a problem, Houston. What happened is that as we glycogenated the liver for, for a little bit, as we added sugar to the liver, it got a little bit better. But then pretty quickly, in a dose-response way, the more sugar we added to the liver, and we became damn good at glycogenating the liver in about three hours. We had a little system, we'd harvest the liver, put it in this little system, and infuse sugar into the liver. And we could glycogenate that thing from zero to max in three hours. But what we found is the greater the gradient of sugar, the more sugar we put in, and we controlled our sugar with insulin, so it was really normal range, just the greater volume of sugar we put in, the, the worse the livers functioned after they got transplanted. Well, that didn't make sense. That was the wrong hypothesis. How the hell does that work? And when we went in to analyze what those blood vessels look like under the microscope, we saw this. It's beautiful pictures. Now, it may not show up so well on the video, but when you look at a healthy blood vessel, now these are the blood vessels in the liver. That's the nice smooth way in which these cells look. They've got little holes for food and things to get through, but that's the nice smooth pathway of a liver. These smooth things are called endothelial cells or the cells that line blood vessels. Now you add sugar. And what happens to these endothelial cells is they swell up. So they're they kind of look like fried eggs when they're healthy. And they're attaching sides and they've got little spaces in between them, but they're nice and smooth. As you add sugar to the bloodstream, what sugar does is every molecule of sugar is attached to a molecule of water and it very rapidly goes into the endothelial cells. And what happens to those cells is when they take up that water and that, and that sugar, well, a flat thing doesn't hold a lot of volume, so they round up. They become, they change from being like fried eggs, they become like boiled eggs. And here you see that effect. And when they become those boiled eggs, they round up. But when they round up, they break away from the underlying, what's called the basement membrane, the wall underneath those cells, the wall of the tissues. And they expose these little blebs and things. And those blebs are very attractive to forming clots because that's an injury. Okay? So it is really the sugar, the carbohydrates that we are infusing that is damaging these nice smooth blood vessels and resulting in this very destructive process whereby you are denuding the blood vessels. And of course, the body doesn't want those blood vessels to leak, so it rapidly forms a clot there. Now, in these two studies, we were just putting sugar in. When you add platelets and white blood cells, here's what happens. There's your blood vessel that's activated by sugar, and guess what? That whole clot forms there. And you see the lipids, you see the, uh, um, the platelets, you see the white blood cells, you see all the damage that's plugging that blood vessel. That blood vessel should be nice and open. There should be blood flowing there, but it's clogged. It's clogged. And what caused that injury? What caused that injury, and that's what my PhD says, what caused that injury was sugar. Glucose. Glucose, galactose, and fructose were the three sugars we used, and we demonstrated in a dose-response way that you could create that injury over and over and over again, and when you put blood back in, the blood would clot along that injury and would plug up those walls, would break down in the bigger blood vessels, and travel down. In fact, we had membranes, filters, that would just become clogged with these, with these embolous clots that were breaking off and going down. Now, that was the model. There's another substance that does exactly the same thing. You may have heard of it. It's called nicotine. Nicotine also damages the very same endothelial cells and causes intravascular clotting. And if you're eating carbohydrates and snacking on them all the time or puffing away on cigarettes on a regular basis, you're causing this injury on a regular basis. And if your insulin system breaks down when it comes to carbohydrates and that sugar level rises up, a little bit of sugar, absolutely fine in the bloodstream. But when the dose response curve goes up because you're eating a ton of sugar all the time and your insulin system breaks down, you become insulin resistant. You're no longer able to remove that sugar. Bad things happen to the vascular endothelium. So your blood pressure goes up because the lumen narrows down. You get these clots and your LDL is going into those clots. And that, my friends... That, my friends, is the cause of cardiovascular disease, at least as it pertains to obesity and metabolic syndrome. It is sugar that's entering the, blood, the bloodstream, 
damaging the blood vessels and you're getting a clotting response. And because there's a repetitive clotting response, it is stabilized by lipids. LDL is not the enemy. LDL is trying to fix the damn problem. The problem that you caused by putting carbohydrates in your face. And we have plenty of proof that when you remove carbohydrates from your diet, when you go on an ultra low carbohydrate, high fat diet, oh my God, it's fat. How can that? Guess what happens? This injury goes away. There are plenty of people on a high fat carnivore diet that have a CAC score, a calcium Sorry, coronary artery calcium score of zero. Mine's zero. Mine's zero. How is that possible? If fat was so bad for us, if this, if this LDL was so bad for us, how is it possible when I eat a ton of fat but no sugar that my CAC score is zero? If they're correct, they're not. The issue with LDL is not that it causes problems. It's responding to a problem. If you get rid of the cause of the problem, LDL is irrelevant in terms of injury. Okay? Now, on the flip side of that, when you treat people with statins, you're reducing the formation of cholesterol, which is a vital, vital, vitally, essentially important molecule in the human body. 30% approximately of our cell membranes is made up of cholesterol, anchoring proteins as a channel for, for entry and exit from the cell, it's a vital part of cell membrane fluidity, particularly in the brain. Cholesterol is also a precursor for all the, for all the steroid hormones, estrogen, testosterone, cortisol, human growth hormone, thyroid hormone, fat absorption, so ADEK absorption, vitamin D3, cholecalciferol. And if you don't have cholesterol, and if you're blocking cholesterol with insulin, Guess what? Your body breaks down. Your risk of Alzheimer's goes up. Statins have awful effects in terms of reducing steroid hormone production and having cellular effects. The problem is those are very difficult to measure. They're difficult to quantify until you have Alzheimer's disease. And all of that because of the misguided notion that LDL causes the problem. Do yourselves an experiment. If your doctor has said, oh, your triglycerides are high, your HDL is low, those are problematic, and your LDL is high, you have to take a statin. Before you take the statin, put yourself on an ultra-low carbohydrate diet for 90 days. Most people can do 90 days. Recheck your blood work. And I can guarantee you, if you do it, you will heal your cholesterol problem. Because you don't have a cholesterol problem. you got a sugar problem. And if you don't stuff your face with carbohydrates, the cholesterol problem vanishes. The problem is that the statin producers and the majority of cardiologists over there do not have this information. They do not want to hear it. They have cognitive dissonance. Please, 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 for your own sake, before you take a statin, get rid of the carbohydrates and then recheck whether you really need one. Statins are far more toxic than they are beneficial. I hope this helps you in your decision making not to eat carbohydrates and therefore not to need a statin. I hope you enjoyed that podcast. If you did, please click the subscribe button and become a subscriber to my YouTube channel. And if that message resonated with you and made you think, and you made a decision to do more to help yourself, but you need help, please come and see us, set up a consultation. We can do it in person in my offices in Palm Beach Gardens at 561-627-4107 or in Jacksonville, Florida at 904-410-3934. I also do some long-distance consults telephonically or on Zoom. Set that up as well by calling 561-627-4107. We help people to manage their diabetes better and also to get started in obesity management. Or if you've had bariatric or obesity surgery and are struggling, give us a shout. We can help to get you back on track.